So let's start just with a little bit of that history that I mentioned. Uh, yeah. You know, I said, you, you've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> I have, actually, uh, longer than some of my youngest voters have uh, been alive. <laughs> so how did you first get interested in open government and what needed to happen? You know, I was, um, uh, did a lot of volunteer work at the local level uh, in the mid-80s, starting with Neighborhood Watch. Mm -hmm. And uh, since I have a law degree, uh, I had an endless number of opportunities to volunteer. And I quickly learned how difficult it was just to get basic information, uh, to find out what was happening with the bill. You know, you had to call somebody's business office long distance between uh, 8 and 5. And uh, then when I was elected to the legislature, and, and I ran because I was too naive to know I couldn't win. Um, and then you did. And I did. <laughs> but the first thing I discovered was that we had everything digital. I'm, in my office, I had all of the bills, all the committee analysis, all the voting records, digital, but no one outside the building had access to that without paying a couple thousand dollars a year. Um, so I introduced a bill uh, that said we're going to have a dial-up uh, bulletin board service, get this information out publicly, and a couple guys from Silicon Valley came into my office and said, uh, no, no, you're doing it wrong. Um, we, w we should do this via the world's largest uh, non-proprietary computer network, and this is before the World Wide Web. So off we went with this little bill, um, and it was a transformative experience for me because when it ultimately did get passed, despite lots of efforts to derail it, I, I began to understand the power of what we could do with putting information directly into citizens' hands. But let me ask you a hard question. Uh, California has a lot of dysfunctionality right now. And many people will argue it's because we put too much power into citizens' hands. No, we don't put too much power in their hands. We don't educate them That's in a way that for. can allow them to make the best decisions about the power they have. That's right. I, I think it was Thomas Jefferson who made the argument that uh, you actually have to have an educated, yes. informed citizenry. It's not just giving power. It's it's about education. It did. And so I guess that really brings me to the main thing I wanted to talk to you about here. How do we get people to be not just engaged, but informed? How do we raise a citizenry that is equipped to understand the issues that government faces and to help make good informed decisions, both about who represents them, but also about the issues that are ahead of them, as opposed to just here comes this uh, set of initiatives on the ballot, and this right. one sounds good. Check the box. Yeah. Well, I think it has to start very early, and we have to remember that, that democracy is not instinctive, that it's uh, something that has to be taught. I was struck a few years ago on a visit to Bosnia uh, to see the civic education system that was developed there, um, and which is, by the way, funded largely by the United States government and which they're teaching kids starting in first grade about individual rights, privacy, autonomy, limits, and then structure, and then you go from, from that basic knowledge really has to be done in a way where, where kids are learning by doing. Um, the deadliest thing I, we can do, I think, is what historically has been the norm. That uh, chart that we have in California, it's placemat size, and it says how a bill becomes a law. Mm -hmm. um, and my foster daughter at one point looked at me and said, where are the lobbyists? <laughs> They're not on the chart. And um, uh, her friend chimed in, oh, it's the white space. Yeah. So getting, it doesn't have to be young people, but for me, um, getting involved in something I cared about, it was uh, the quality of the Santa Monica Bay. Mm -hmm. in the, in the, uh, at that time, and went, that went on to many other things. But that led me to learn, well, who, who has the reins here? Who has the power? Who has the money? Uh, how decisions get made? What levels of government affect that? And if you do that with kids around an issue they care about, you have a much better likelihood of getting the kind of informed citizenry that Thomas Jefferson envisioned. Uh, right.
Well, I think you know this raises a sort of a question in general about education, and, and I think there's been a focus recently uh, around problem-centered education, learning, teaching by tackling real-world issues, and you know I think that's certainly part of how you think we should be teaching mm -hmm. civics and government. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, we, you know, we do some things right now. Uh, we have a high school mock election, and we had uh, over a quarter of a million students participate in that in 2008. The Constitutional Rights Foundation and the uh, Center for the Civic Mission of Schools helped w work to create a curriculum that a teacher could use that doesn't put an extra burden on the teacher either to come up with something new or to teach something in addition to what's already required. So that by just using that mock election module um, that you've got participation and understanding in how the electoral part of the process works. And that turns out to be really important. Um, it turns out that for teenage boys in particular, if they don't know how to do something, like vote, mm -hmm. that they may choose simply not to try because they don't want to be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. um, now, that happens with girls, too, but it turns out that it's a bigger issue with boys. So, so the mock election is just literally practicing. It's practicing. Yeah. And how does this work? And, and mm -hmm. uh, how, do the, how do the actual mechanics of it work? If we can take an optical scan uh, ballot counting yep. machine, if we can take a voter registration card, well, and the whole voter registration card thing is ridiculous, but uh, that won't yeah. be around for that much longer. So uh, you have some interest in open source voting? Absolutely. So... Talk to us about that. Well, Why think, do we need open source voting systems? You know, of all of the functions that we have in government, the place where I think you can best make the argument for open source software and public ownership is in the elections process. Uh, because, because we have this nexus of having a private ballot so that there, we try to lessen the possibility of coercion or undue influence and really respect the individual choice. You can have an argument with your spouse, uh, you know, and then half an hour later walk into the polling place and do something that you absolutely know uh, would not meet with uh, the approval, approval of spouse, grandparent, grandchild, whatever, and that's our system. But when you have software that's proprietary and where no one um, in, other, in California, no one other than the Secretary of State can review the code, you basically have a, rep, a recipe for, for people to be suspicious. So how are your code uh, scanning skills? <laughs> you know, I was pleasantly, not just surprised, but shocked at the number of computer programmers who have been involved both um, as volunteers and professionally at evaluating voting system hardware and software. Um, there's a, a guy by the name of Philip Stark, who's an auditor, who when I asked him to serve on a panel to help us find better ways of auditing election results so that we sample the right size, and things, his career shifted That's from what he's doing. So, yeah. but, but it shouldn't be the case that I have to appoint people who have the skills make them sign non-disclosure agreements, um, and then... And, er and every state has to do it over again. Right. Uh, so I guess one of the questions, uh, how far are we from having open source voting systems adopted? Well, there's, there's movement, and there is already in existence a system that uh, uses open source software in the registration context to take data that's entered in a voter registration form, turn it into a barcode, uh, and then instead of having somebody sit and retype the data, which is what happens in California, uh, Los Angeles County, 30 or 40,000 voter registration cards a day towards the deadline, and there is a huge room full of people trying to read the handwriting of thousands and thousands of Californians and trying to say, well, is this the middle name or the surname? Um, and creating data errors. But if, right. So that is an open source piece of code that anyone can use, right. any state, any organization, and not, which saves us a ton of money, mm -hmm. reduces error, gets the whole process faster, uh, moving faster, and, and that's one of the first things that uh, one of the open source groups did, mm -hmm. because it's something that, that was tangible and they could deliver immediately. So, I mentioned before California is in the middle of a budget crisis. Mm -hmm. what, 
you know, what do you in government do about that? How do you think about, you know, again, uh, at least for me as a, uh, an outsider, you know, uh, 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 one of the problems seems to be that there's actually very, very little uh, discretionary money. Right. You know, it's basically the budget is, has been allocated by the citizens uh, through the initiative process, right. and those things can't be uh, affected, so the actual budget authority is relatively small uh, relative to the entire thing. How do we change our situation like that? Um, well, a couple of things. One is, you know, if you, if you look at the open source registration barcode system, and uh, there are a couple of other barcode systems, that saves a phenomenal amount of money. Paying somebody to type data from a form is really one of the silliest things we can do in 2010. And we do it in corporations and all the business filings I handle. But it does strike me that one of the So that, that's just free up money. But no, it does, but it's still uh, marginal. Uh, it does strike me that one of the issues that we face throughout government is that how money is to be spent gets actually hard-coded in the system, you know, either through you know, legislation or regulations or in initiatives. Right. And that doesn't allow us to, to respond to change. And we become more sclerotic as a society. We become more sclerotic as government because we have less and less uh, that we can actually use to respond to today's challenges rather than uh, you know, the challenges that people thought about last year. Well, you're arguing basically for a constitutional convention. Well, either that or... or something, or, or, something or, radical. Uh, you know, another aspect that seems to me, you know, would run through many of our systems would be if we had sunset provisions that were automatically built in. And, you know, this is certainly true in copyright. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's been extended, extended, extended. If, in fact, we went back to the idea of the founders that it had a limited duration. You know, if every law had a limited duration and had to be renewed, uh, we'd have a very different... Yeah, I hear, that, I hear that fairly often, but, you know, I think there are a lot of things that actually work <clears throat> where it would be just a big waste of time to do mm -hmm. it. Um, we really don't want to review every law that governs um, what the filings have to look like to be a valid California That's fair. corporation. That's fair. Uh, you don't want to, I mean, there are just so many examples like that. So it's a little like auditing an election or anything else. You want to be able to focus your efforts on the things that matter. Um, but with the initiative process, we have an additional problem in that historically we have not given California citizens the kind of information that they deserve at the right time in the process. And the time when we really have missed the boat is when people are choosing whether or not to sign something. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't tell them whether the person who's there is a volunteer or whether they are, they are making potentially as much as ten or twelve dollars for a single signature. Wow! So I have long advocated, and I'll try again with another governor because I've had this vetoed several times, <laughs> to have a law that says that uh, on an initiative petition, I want in really big type at the top, volunteer circulator or paid circulator. Because I think people are really smart, and they know that you have different questions to ask based on that. Wow. And yes, then I, didn't know that. I want at the bottom of the petition, also in big type, the five largest contributors who are paying mm -hmm. to circulate that initiative. Mm -hmm. Because right now we find that out during election season, but at that point we're engaged in what's often a 30, 40, 50 million dollar battle. Yeah, uh, that, that kind of brings up. Um uh, kind of the role of the media. Uh, we're not getting that information uh, from our news anymore. You know, I, I think about uh, the wonderful program that uh, Sunlight Foundation ran uh, where they were during the healthcare debate, or was it, yeah, I think it was the healthcare debate where they were overlaying uh, the picture of each speaker uh, with the campaign contributions and who they were from. Yes. And, you know, that was basically this little Sunlight project. But you'd love to see that on major media. But, you know, I, I I'm always want to be careful with that. Do we have that. a mic in the audience? Or are you willing to take questions Absolutely. from the audience? Absolutely. Yeah, if we have a mic in the audience, it would be I always fantastic. want to be careful with that because the assumption that a $1,000 campaign contribution determines the vote of a legislator, um, you know, I think it often works the other way around. You have a legislator who believes that... Um, that the best thing for us to do for our future energy, energy needs is to exploit all the fossil fuel resources we can. That person is going to receive campaign contributions from different sources than someone who thinks 
the fossil fuel system we've created is a mess. And it's we a really good point. The, the donation is not necessarily the influence. It may be to support something that's already a position. That's your point. Yeah, or to support yeah. the election of someone yeah. who is, you know, I mean, yeah. I, I don't have a problem with getting massive contributions, for example, from the petroleum industry. Uh huh. They're not interested in contributing to my campaign. <laughs> so, yeah, right, right. <laughs> so do we have any, any questions from the audience here? All right, doesn't look like... Uh, Someone that Twitter lied when... But I do think, I mean, that. the other point of this is that, you know, when you say the media, we're at a place yeah. in, in our country where, uh, where I would ask, well, who's that? Yeah. Um, to some extent, it's us. And uh, uh, many of our Gen X and Gen Y uh, people get more information from Stephen Colbert and Jon Stewart than I, they I, do I, from, I, uh, from uh, I, I, Ted Koppel. I think that's true, although it was, it was ironic. I, 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 maybe I'll be in trouble for mentioning this. I was backstage at uh, um, Evening News um, recently and uh, uh, you know, watching from the control room. And it was kind of sad because uh, at one point somebody calls out, so-and-so ran long, uh, you know, cut the story on the financial reform bill. And instead what we got was a story about uh, a... a dog that had saved somebody's life in Afghanistan and was now reunited with him, brought the dog had been brought back to the U.S., and a story about a, g a guy who got villagers in Japan to um, plant rice paddies in artistic patterns, and that was the evening news. And it was, it was sobering and sad uh, how, uh, you know, something that used to be, I think, part of our uh, civic culture is now so oriented towards just uh, entertainment. It was like the evening news is now People Magazine. You know, but I, I see among the under 30 voters right now a real reemergence of, of yeah. engagement. And they, don't, they may not engage in the same yeah. way that I might have or you might yeah. have, um, but they are engaged. Oh, I totally believe that. Uh, and, and, but, and, and the, but the question is, who's their credible uh, news source? And it goes back to education That's because right. lit literacy, media literacy, is such a key part of, you know, who, who owns this news outlet? All right. So do we have a question? And I'm sure we do. Yes. Hi. We have a question from the Twitter stream here. Please ask Deb Bowen why e-signatures did not make it for this year's election process in California. I'm assuming that this, uh, that this refers to a proposal to have voter registration uh, be enabled via um, a, a signature on yeah. an iPhone. Um, and the, the simple answer is that California law clearly requires a wet signature. When the, the law was written, it didn't contemplate um, that. But there are some good policy questions, I think, that we need to ask. The arguments made that uh, it's actually will be more secure, we'll, we'll know who it is that's signing because we'll have information like the speed at which someone signs and the, the pressure. Um, that's true, but only if you have a database that has that information to compare it to, and we don't. So uh, we've, uh, we've got issues, I think, that are important about whether the signatures and that kind of metadata that would yep. enable someone to forge, should, is that a public record? Should that be a public record right. if we do that? But there is increasingly, it's, it's interesting, we had Osama Bedier from PayPal here uh, yeah. yesterday, and we talked a little bit about um, you know, the multi-factor authentication that they use to validate uh, that somebody is, in fact, really the person who yes. is authorizing that payment. And I think we're increasingly in a situation where people have a device, uh, right. they have various online information associated with that device, and it does become... Yeah. Uh, well, and we'll, we will get there. There's no question that we're, we will get to a place where we either are registering people with an online signature or we're taking the signature that exists either at the Department of Motor Vehicles or at any other government program and moving that. Uh, California is making progress in that regard, although it's slower than I would like. All right, we have another question over here from uh, the well-named No Neck. Uh, thank at you. No Neck. <laughs> um, 
So uh, I work for a state legislature in New York um, and know the complications that all states, particularly the big states, are facing uh, in regards to budget shortfalls, massive deficits. Um, what is the single, and I know that California went through a very interesting experience last summer, uh, what is the single, uh, uh, or what is the largest impedance besides the actual elected officials um, to uh, balance the budget? Uh, where would you see uh, the state, uh, wh what is the first thing that should be cut? I think that's the wrong question. Um, and really, California has, it's one of only two states that, uh, one of five states, I guess, that requires a supermajority vote for the budget. It requires a two-thirds vote to pass a budget in California. Um, it's challenging enough to do things with a majority vote, it's extremely difficult with two-thirds vote, and it really muddies any kind of sense of accountability because you can't really tell who's, who's responsible for what. So I think that's an issue. It, that's a challenging issue because it's also viewed as a protection for minority interests, but historically it hasn't done very well. Um, another thing that I think people expected would, would improve the situation is um, term limits. And while that has certainly brought in, well, it brought in people like me who had never run for office and never thought about it, um, when you have people who fundamentally disagree philosophically, and we have that in this country, um, it, it really ultimately is relationships of trust that allow people to get things done across that kind of uh, partisan divides or philosophical divides. And when people can only be in office for a short period of time, they think short term and they don't develop the kinds of relationships that allow them to say, how can we create a master plan for higher education in California that will allow us to ensure that everyone has access? Uh, that's, uh, how do we create a state water project to ensure water? Those kinds of big thinking ideas came from a time uh, when people spent a long time in government I know that there were there are always downsides to that, and there are always there's somebody who, like in sports, plays a little too long. But I think that's uh, that's been difficult as well. And the third is just the, the enormous complexity of the system, between the initiative process, what does the federal government do, what's funded by the states, what's funded by the locals, what highway money do you lose if your state doesn't uh, treat possession of marijuana in a certain way. Um, it's complicated, and the more, so civic education, I keep coming back to that. Got to have a system where not everybody can be expert in everything, but where enough people choose to be involved in a particular issue of concern so that pressure from the citizenry is enough to generate the solutions. Thank you very much, Secretary Bowen. I love your perspectives. Uh, thank you so much for coming here to share them with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.